Bum, bum. All right, friends, I invite you to show up a little bit. Roll those shoulders back. Um, wiggle your toes and your shoes. Feel your feet here in this space. Become aware of your breath. Just be here. And um, I invite us to really hold uh, what, we, what we started with, this question of, of belonging and membership in something. Uh, and we really en- are entering into this space now of, of, of that. So what does it mean to feel welcomed into a group of people? What does, that, what does that look like? How does it happen? Thinking about our own experiences. Can I? I'm going to, that's going to, yeah. Um, although I could like at the end of every paragraph or sentence just <laughs> like a little beatnik. I don't know. Anyway, okay. <laughs> would not be, anyway, that would not be pretty. Okay. Um, man, but thinking of the times when we have joined something, a church or a club or a group, uh, a new job and with the colleagues that go with it, all those relationships. And think about how there are sometimes official ways in which we are welcomed, like there's membership stuff. Uh, but sometimes, uh, well, I mean, I'll see about, so there's like getting your library card. I feel very official when I have my library card. Uh, signing a church charter, which we are in the process of doing now. But when, or when we pay fees and fill out forms, like there's ways in which we become members. But there's also beyond that, the like actually feeling like we belong somewhere in something. And uh, how those are two different things of what it means to be part of a community. So here at Salt House, perhaps our most defining uh, core practice is that of embodying Jesus' practice of radical welcome, which is why we say at the beginning of every service, we just want to be a place and a group of people that welcomes and affirms people no matter what, no matter what what we believe or don't believe, no matter what boxes we check or labels we carry uh, or reject or the experiences that we have or have not had. We want, uh, we want both membership and belonging for everyone who is here, Right? And historically, for all that the Christian church has done and continues to do to not embody this message of love and inclusion, I'm, I'm so overwhelmingly, great, overwhelmingly grateful for all the ways that we get to change that and live this practice and this message here at Salt House. But it is interesting, though, because we are part of a faith tradition, we are part of Christianity, and we are part of a larger institution, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Uh, that actually they do have certain requirements in place that shape what it means to officially belong to a particular church community. And the tension of being who we are here at Salt House as radically welcoming is coming against, up against some of those uh, requirements given the season that we are in here as a community. And what I mean by that, the season that we are in, to catch us all up, if you're new today, uh, here at Salt House, we, we launched as a mission start church three years ago and we are parented by Holy Spirit Lutheran Church across town here in Kirkland. So their church council has all the fiduciary and legal responsibility for us. So we, they're our parent. We're the, we're the mission start uh, sponsored by them. But we're in the process of changing that. We're over halfway through our six-month journey spanning from January to, to July 1st of becoming an independent recognized church within the ELCA. Uh, we've called these six months our journey of hashtag adulting as we uh, all grow up together and we get to do this work to launch from the nest. And at the end of this month, two weeks away, people, is April 29th. Uh, We have our big vote. We're gathering that morning for worship and for a meeting and for a party. And this is the most significant kind of communal piece that we'll share in together as a church as we say yes to becoming a church and we do the legal business of approving our constitution, of electing our governing church council, and voting to call our pastor. I'm technically a pastor of Holy Spirit Lutheran Church right now. So with some sort of persuasion, I might be able to come and be your pastor here. So, no, no, okay, I'm, I'm in, I'm all in. Um, but we have to go through that official process as, as an official separate community. So in light of April 29th and that voting and saying yes together, and mindful again of the diversity of this community for which I'm so grateful, this month we are, we're having these orienting conversations to get us ready for April 29th. And so we're looking at what the ELCA is. What is that? Uh, what do they believe? Last week we looked briefly, briefly at the ELCA's history, the structure and governance of the ELCA and some of the theology. I know if you missed it, you're going, man, I missed out. Um, no, no, it was really good. It was really good. Uh, but I also shared some of my own story as to why I chose to stay in to become a part of the ELC, even to the point of becoming a pastor in the ELC, so I shared some of my story too. And last week we named, um, uh, and this is for all of us to go on this, that 
This is for all of us to get on the same page, to have transparency about who we are, uh, but to be clear, as we go through this, just again to name three things. First, we already are an ELCA church, so that's not changing. We're just becoming an independent church. Second, you do not have to identify as Lutheran to be here, whether you know now or after April 29th. No labels are required. Everyone is still welcome. It's just the the tree that we're nesting in. And third, we name that uh, it is a weird paradox focusing on our institutional structure, like so much when Jesus said, follow me. And he did not say, go build an institution with, you know, a church hierarchy and like, don't, you know, like, uh, Jesus, I don't think this is what, anyway, so that tension is there of like, it's, it's weird, we have to talk about all this, and just naming that paradox, that it's real, and so we acknowledge it, and today we're going to dive into why we still need to embrace that and go through this in order to follow Jesus as he invites us to. So because today, not only do we have worship, we have our potluck, as Sean said, woo uh, because it is the third Sunday of the month. Good and sacred things happen when we eat together, which is what we say here at Salt House. And good things especially happen when we eat together during our Constitution Forum, which happens today. That's right, folks. So today, during our meal, we are all invited to have a chance to attend this, this conversation. Our Constitution team has the draft of our Salt House Constitution for us. It was emailed out on, emailed out on Friday, if you were on our email list. Uh, they want to catch us up on the important pieces that they've worked on, gather any questions and feedback, and then have the final draft ready for us in two weeks. Your input is so important, so please come and join that conversation. So as I say that, if you're newer to the life of church, or even if you're not, but you've never really known how it all works behind the scenes, like people behind the curtain, uh, there is a very important question that needs addressing, which is, why do we need a constitution? And I've touched on this in passing over the last few months, but just to make it clear again, we need a constitution governing documents in order to officially affiliate with the ELCA as well as function legally as a nonprofit in the state of Washington. And I intentionally started, you know, again with this question of wel welcoming and belonging because as a nonprofit, we need a legal definition of the expectations that define who our members are because members have influence over the governing of our church. And so again, this is some of that tension we're coming up against, and our constitution team has been working hard to navigate that, you know, figuring out how to have arms wide open approach to who is considered a member at Salt House that fits legally. Uh, by the standards of Washington State, it also reflects who we are. And additionally, they're also holding the attention because the ELCA has required definition for membership in its churches, um, which we've, we've mentioned this before too. And our team has worked hard, petitioned, and has a solution they've come to for some of this, which I want to speak to today. Uh, so today is a big old conversation to orient us about what it means to be a member at Salt House based on our Constitution. I know. You are so glad you came today, too. I know, I know, I know. Um, this is totally hashtag adulting, as we, because these are the conversations that we need to have as we orient ourselves. Uh, but really, I think this will be a very fruitful conversation. Again, and we're talking about membership. I think most of the time at Sawhouse, we're talking about belonging. What does it mean to belong to the life of God and to each other? This is way more technical and different than, than that conversation. So, related, but different. So today, we get to have a big old conversation, then. We're actually gonna talk about baptism because uh, the ELCA is a denomination that is very rooted in baptism, particularly when it comes to membership. So for example, in the Constitution, so the ELCA has what's called a model constitution. So that is the, like the document that all of the ELCA churches start with when they write their own constitution for their own congregation. So that's what we started with. It has a few blanks to fill in as we make decisions about things, as well as sections that can be written differently and edited. And the model constitution is very helpful because it reflects the norms of the church as well as government and legal requirements. Again, how we exist as a nonprofit in the state. Uh, so that, that kind of heavy lifting is done for us when we just have that model constitution to work with. But the vast majority of the constitution, the sections that have a little asterisk next to them, it means they cannot be altered without permission from the ELCA, which mostly means they just really can't be altered. Um, so, that's, so, so that's a vast majority of the document. But as you begin to read the model constitution, it begins with a preamble, a few sentences, and there's little asterisks there. And the first few words, it reads like this. It says, we, the baptized members of the Church of Christ. So it's the beginning of the Constitution, which is, at first glance, is a beautiful first nine words, right? But there's an assumption that the ELCA makes about the people gathered in its church's buildings, an assumption that was safe to make, you know, 30 years ago when the ELCA was formed, but not as much today. What's that assumption? That we're all baptized. 
It's a thing. So throughout history, you know, the, throughout the history of the Christian church and of the ELC, you know, is a very strong example of, of this. Baptism has, been, baptism has been the defining characteristic of membership in churches. That and being confirmed. So confirmation refers to someone who's been baptized as a child, probably an infant, who then later in life confirms their faith as their own. So it's like being through another baptism, but not. It's just confirming that the baptism happened, and they're like, yes, I'm, I'm saying yes to that. I want to follow Jesus. Also, so someone who's a ba- baptized later in life, they are considered both baptized and confirmed because they've gone through the process to be prepared for baptism, so they are baptized and confirmed. But confirmation, uh, anyone been through confirmation? Is that something? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> says a lot. Okay, um, so, so it's a, in mainline churches, Catholic churches, um, that's, there's a whole process to it. In the ELC, it's usually seventh and eighth grade. It's two years long with um, one year learning about the Bible and then a year learning about like Lutheran theology and Reformation history because who doesn't want to do that in middle school, right? <laughs> I don't, anyway, um, so Anyone of any age can be confirmed, though. So for adults, again, it can look differently as they're baptized as an adult, or churches have, like, you have to go through these classes as a way of learning, or sometimes it's just, like, just by saying, yeah, I want to be a part of this community. Okay, cool, you are confirmed as a part of of this. So that can be enough, too. So it varies in different places. So this assumption of everyone being baptized, though, may not be a big deal to you because maybe you're baptized, but it is a big deal to many of us here and many folks who will walk through our doors because we want people here to collaborate in our life together without needing to check any boxes. Again, we want them to be members and feel like they belong both. And baptism and being confirmed may not be the right thing for them based on where they are in their own faith. Uh, you know, and it may not be ever something that they, that they want. So there are so many reasons why people come here to Salt House, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, they want to just explore the life of Jesus or invest in community or grow and be changed or get plugged in the, at the New Bethlehem Day Center. And making the commitment of baptism is an amazing piece of that, of our own journey for many of us. But it's one of those things that needs to be changed, making room at the table for others who may not be in that same place. I mean, that's radical welcome indeed, right? Saying, cool, you are welcome. Don't need to baptize, cool. Right on. Um, So the Constitution team uh, wrote a two-page introduction to our Constitution to benefit us as we sit down for this forum later today, a document just explaining their process, their approach, and the petitions that they made. And they said it well. They said how... um, as we are a community, you know, whose wings have strengthened and feathers have grown in, and as we look at, to leave the nest of Holy Spirit, like, you know, the ELCA is the tree in which Salt House has chosen to build its own nest. And as a result, we are both supported by and bound by this structure that we are connected to, which is a great image, I think, for us. And there are such blessings to be associated with the ELCA, which we've explored in recent months. And because of our tree where we are nesting, as I said, I want to spend time today exploring baptism, specifically the history of it. Um, So not so much the meaning of it. I mean, that'll come through a little bit, but this is really looking at how it has evolved over time. And this will be like super abbreviated, you know, 2,000 years of baptism in like six minutes. So um, super abbreviated, but it will help orient us, I think, in how it was originally formed and how baptism was intended, as well as some of the ways in which it has changed over time. Because guess what? The original intention of baptism has not held out over the years, which is fascinating. So are you game for that journey? I know, you're like, great, Constitution Sunday, woo! Okay, so just, again, I, want, I invite you to just be mindful, um, even just plug into your own experience of, how, you know, have you been baptized? What has that meant to you in your life? Your, um, if, if you haven't been, what has that been like? What has it been like to observe others who have been baptized? Just kind of be in touch with your own story and be mindful of, of what it means to belong and feel welcomed in community as well yet also holding that institutional tension. So holding all these things, inviting God to speak to us, even as we work through some technical stuff, let's look at how baptism baptism has been a part of all of that. So hang on, because we're going to try to rip through this fast, okay? You ready? Okay. So let's start with Scripture. We're going to start in Scripture, and then let it carry us through history. But first, I want us to start with water. A Lutheran pastor and writer, Dan Erlander, he speaks beautifully about water, about how he, he points out how the origin of Christian baptism lies in humanity's common experience with water. It is water which surrounds us in the womb. I gave birth to our four-year-old four years ago today, uh, so I've been mindful of all of that stuff. Um, today, <laughs> woo! And uh, so water surrounds us in the womb. Water also washes and cleanses us. 
Water sustains and refreshes us. Water terrifies and even kills us. And water causes our food to grow. So it's no wonder that virtually every religious community, past and present, has some form of water ritual or ceremonies connected to water. The stories of water in the Bible are breathtaking, just so rich with metaphor and layers of meaning. The Hebrew people, our faith ancestors, were no exception in their connections with water. They practiced water ceremonies in the tabernacle. They bathed themselves for healing. Converts to Judaism are baptized, adults, children, and infants. It happened then uh, in in biblical times. It happens still today. If you heard Gila's story uh, back in January when she shared her story here at Salt House, um, you heard about that as part of her own story. So to be clear... Christians are not the only ones who use water in significant ways as connected mysteriously to the life of God. So it's just, it's really beautiful to consider how universal the use of water is. But I wonder too, is that surprising to you? Did you know that? So in the great narrative of the Old Testament, so the Hebrew people, uh, they were connected to water in another way. It was through the waters of the Red Sea that God liberated the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt, another kind of baptism of sorts as they made that passage from slavery into freedom and beginning their long, difficult journey into the Promised Land. Uh, This and many other stories of water in the Old Testament, uh, much later then, influenced John the Baptist, Jesus' forerunner. His Jewish audience, you know, as they heard him, they would hear him through the lens of the Exodus, receiving his invitation to come and be washed in the waters and grounded again in God's life for them. They would hear that as a return to the waters of the Red Sea once again. So John even baptized Jesus before Jesus began his public ministry, And then three years later, after Jesus' resurrection, but before he leaves his disciples, he says something about baptism. And uh, we call it the Great Commission, what many have come to call the mission statement of the church. Uh, It's it's our reading for today, actually. I think Taryn's reading. Cool. Um, Come on up. So as we continue to celebrate resurrection, like we had Easter Sunday, we continue to celebrate resurrection this month. And this is a story that happened right after Jesus' resurrection. Uh, This is Matthew's telling of that. And this is that moment when um, on Easter Sunday, that first Easter, when he goes and is reunited with the disciples. Um, And this is what happens as they are together. Meanwhile... The eleven disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I will be with you as you do this, day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. Thank you. The Great Commission. Uh, So we're going to come back to that, so hold on to it. Don't let it slip away. Uh, Hold it. Uh, But let's keep moving through Scripture and through history. We'll get back to this later. So that happens, and after Jesus is gone in the New Testament, uh, we see baptism practiced as the initiation experience of the church. As Jesus' followers gathered around and shared life together, baptism was the ritual that welcomed the new followers into the life of the community and to receive the Holy Spirit in that moment. Though reading the stories, particularly in the book of Acts, um, you see how there's just... It's not as formulaic as that. Uh, sometimes the Spirit of God just like shows up and they're like, well, I guess we should do a baptism. You know, <laughs> they just like, it's very organic in ways in which God shows up and the way in which the, the community responds to that as they become part of the life of Jesus. So to be clear, it isn't like, it isn't that structured, which is lovely. Um, then by, so that's, that's right after Jesus is gone. Then by the third century, still with me? I'm just like, I'm moving. Still here? Okay. So by the third century, the practice of baptism was one that came after a lengthy time of preparation. Often three years was spent uh, as one that, um, and then afterwards, after the three years, uh, the baptism would take place at sunrise on Easter morning, co- corresponding with the moment of Jesus' own emergence out of the tomb, which is just lovely. So this was, this was at the time when the Roman Empire still held power and, and occupation. And as we talked about on Palm Sunday, the Roman Empire was the most advanced and brutal military force the world had ever seen. 
And the Roman Empire, uh, you know, they exploited the land and the resources of its colonies using cheap labor and slavery. Slave rebellions were deterred by the threat of crucifixion, gladiator fighting, elitism, gluttony, prostitution, greed, and gross consumerism abounded. Violence was glorified. There was a rigid system of, based on clan and wealth and military and imperial favor that defines you know, who's higher and lower, who's acceptable, who's unacceptable. So this is like the culture that, they're, that, that is happening at that time under the, under the power of the Roman Empire. But then there was this other way, right? Following Jesus instead of Caesar was a way to flip it all on its head where all people had equal worth. And so in this context, Jesus' followers saw their baptism as a movement from a life centered in the ways of the Roman Empire to a life centered in Jesus. So the lengthy, lengthy, lengthy preparation time that they spent, it gave the new, the new Christian time to unlearn the old way and learn the new way. So baptizing and teaching, as it said in our scripture, taking time to do both, and, and absolutely learning that new life, like Jesus said. So a way that was centered around the table uh, for a shared meal, remembering Jesus and then taking the food to those who did not have it that was left over from the meal, pooling resources for those who were in need, praying for and helping those who were sick. And for this, Christians faced the threat of death for not worshiping the emperor. They were called disloyal, subversive, unpatriotic, and even atheistic. So in the early centuries of the church, baptism was a subversive, dangerous choice to go another way, to go into the way of love and inclusion. Don't you love that? I love that. That's what it meant to be baptized at that time. But that all shifted beginning in the fourth century when Emperor Constantine made Christianity the favored religion. Christendom was born The church was no longer subversive, but it was actually in league with the ruling political powers. So church and state together. When the vast majority of the people had become Christian, infant baptism became the norm. The exception was adult converts in the mission fields. So from the 4th to 16th centuries, there were many changes in the practice and theology of baptism. The biggest change was a certain kind of movement, and it was this. It was movement from baptism as leaving an old reality to enter a new reality, moving from the way of death to the way of life on this earth, right? So something that happens here and now, what we engage in, to then, to baptism being as a necessary ritual, so one goes to heaven instead of eternal punishment after death. Do you see how much it shifted? From the celebration of moving into a way of existing in this world to this insurance policy after death, And how that shift, right, we still hear this so often, right, in the Christian narrative. It wasn't supposed to be like that. So that was part of what happened between the 4th and 16th centuries. Other things happened too, but that's the most significant that we'll lift up today. So then in the 16th century, enter Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation brought renewal to the church, but also pain and division But part of the renewal was the rediscovery of baptism as central to the life of Christians. Luther began shifting it back, liberating baptism from this role of imparting like a ticket to heaven. Instead, he taught a New Testament understanding baptism as an event of new birth and union with Jesus. We're forever joined to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection as you receive love and continually discover how to live that love in our lives. We're marked with Jesus' cross and as we live then that pattern of dying and rising again and again. So I cannot state it more directly than this, that Luther adored baptism. Like he wrote of it prolifically, Uh, he wondrously about all that it meant as an experience of life and grace and the gospel like embodied in the waters and here is God, like he just adored it. So we're not gonna get into all of that, but one piece of how Luther's great Uh, just how he engaged with it, was that baptism was of such great comfort to him. So when he was in hard times and times of despair, you know, he would come back and he would, he would say, you know, he wrote about, he would like, he would say, I am baptized. I am baptized. Like that was how he knew he belonged to God. And he spoke of a daily pattern of being baptized again and again, that it's not a one-time event, but remembering that daily rhythm of dying and rising is the pattern that Jesus invites us into, arising with Jesus into a way of being in the world, 
All the stuff that we spoke about during our Lenten series, our journey of falling upward, Luther would be all about it. So, so again, that rhythm of, of falling to the ground and rising. So 16th century to now, uh, there's been more shifting. Three great movements uh, influenced uh, the Reformation churches, orthodoxy, rationalism, and pietism. So I'm going to say is just those things. If you know them, awesome. If you don't, don't worry about it. So all three, in their own ways, marginalized both baptism and Holy Communion, pushing those things to the sides. So baptism, again, was no longer um, at the center of Christian life, so it was seen, again, as a requirement for entrance into heaven. Again, that language that we still hear even today. But again, much of that shifted again, was given new grace and life in the 1960s through the Roman Catholic Church's decisions at Vatican II, which um, a lot happened in that time, but uh, it refocused baptism as an experience of what God does. And again, brought baptism fonts literally to the center of the life of Christian churches again. But as we know, those, those marks of Christendom and just the other shifts over the centuries, we still experience how they linger on, those shifts away from the original intention of baptism, of this way of life. So, Tracing baptism very quickly through 2,000 years, uh, do you see some of the beautiful beginnings that it had? Do you see how some of that beauty was lost and then restored and then blurred a bit over time? Two uh, just quick additional things on baptism from my perspective. So Luther retained infant baptism as a practice, which hadn't been a very common uh, practice before Christendom. Um, so the ELC actually practices baptizing babies and people of all ages. Um, one of the reasons that I love infant baptism is that it's this obvious expression of God's grace. An infant did nothing to, de- to earn, deserve, to achieve, to be uh, worthy of a gift of being connected to Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. It's total, just obvious grace and gift from God in that moment. As we named last week, grace is part of what Lutheranism brings to the theological conversation that I find to be particularly wonderful. Uh, But don't mishear me, I also love adult baptisms or for older children. Uh, For those who choose it for themselves, it's just so powerful to see someone uh, make that decision. So baptism can happen at any time, that's kind of the Lutheran stance on it. We celebrate how there is is such beautiful uh, and organic ways in which our faith plays out, so that right time can be at any time during someone's life. And again, um, all are welcome here no matter what moment of baptism, like whenever that fell or whenever it does fall or even if it doesn't. The second thing I want to name too is is that baptism is for us. It's for our sake and benefit and blessing in that it's not for God's sake. What I mean by that, it goes back to what we talked about on Easter Sunday, how Jesus did not come to change uh, God's mind about humanity, but to change humanity's mind about God. There is something holy and mysterious and filled with gift and blessing that happens in the midst of, of baptism. It is, as the original intent named, a way for us to enter a new kind of life on this earth. But, but God does not need us to be baptized in order for God to love, forgive, accept, welcome us, to be like in with God by God's standards and on, from God's side of things. So baptism is not for God. Though this is what's often expressed, you know, there's like, oh, that fear that what if the baby dies before it's baptized or if an adult dies before they've been baptized. You know, there's like this superstition around it. But God doesn't need a baptism in order to love and to feel connection with us. So God is not limited to loving within the bounds of our rituals. Does that make sense? But in those rituals, our sacraments, we, we can have peace and reassurance of something physical, kind of proof in a sense, of that connection. Like it was for Luther, you know, baptism can be this reassurance in hard times that we are connected to Jesus's life. Uh, we, uh, we're able to remember then, as Jesus said to his disciples, as we just read in the Great Commission, that he is with us day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. That being through the experience, the sacrament of baptism becomes that touchstone for us, being reminded and grounded in that, like that proof, that physical something. That's what I mean by baptism being for us, for our sake, for our comfort. You still with me? Okay. So this all brings us back to our Constitution. So as you uh, read the ELC Constitution, there's a section on membership. 
So getting back to our membership stuff. So membership is chapter eight of the Constitution. Uh, you'll see a big long section with an asterisk, and it works through the varying kinds of membership, which have evolved over time, but there's letters A through E. And do you know what you find there? Membership based on baptized and confirmed folks. Because who do we historically trace our teachings from? Jesus and the early church and Martha, Martin Luther, who was beautifully obsessed with baptism and saw baptism as this connection to life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as a pattern for our lives. I mean, it's beautiful that baptism um, is, is this way to make that commitment to this life. But on the Salt House Constitution, fresh off the, like, fresh off the presses, uh, you'll find something else. We added a letter F. So our constitution team petitioned the ELCA to add another definition of who members can be outside of baptism and confirmation. And letter F is, I mean, it's all of us. I mean, in a way, it's just all of us. Um, as we collaborate in the mission and life of Salt House here in this place and figure out what we're doing in our neighborhood, you know, we all get to participate fully in the in-house life of Salt House with a very small caveat that the interfacing with the ELCA and our affiliation with the ELCA, like that will only be with folks who have made that commitment to be baptized and confirmed. So it's like you have to kind of abide by the policies of the institution in order to do the little, the, the working with the Constitution. So let me explain a little bit. So let's actually just look at it. So it, the whole section reads like this. So this is section F. There it is. So additionally, voting members may also be persons who have made an intentional public commitment to this congregation, affirmed by the Congregation Council, and who during the current or preceding calendar year shall have communed in this congregation because eating together at Jesus' table, it's a central part of who we are at Salt House, that's good, and shall have made a contribution of record to this congregation, and by contribution means of time, service, financial contribution, just investing in the life of the community. Members who submit a written application stating that they have satisfied these basic standards shall have all of the usual privileges and duties of voting members, but shall recognize that. So again, everything that the, that the community does, the entire life of the community, except for these three things. The right to vote on any matter concerning or affecting the affiliation of this congregation with the ELCA shall remain with confirmed voting members. Makes sense. Like, you can't vote to leave the ELCA. Okay. So number two. The role of members of this congregation at the Synod Assembly or the Churchwide Assembly is to be filled by confirmed voting members. We have ways in which we gather regionally um, in uh, Northwest Washington, but then also as, as the entire ELCA within the country. And so those folks just need to be folks who've been baptized and confirmed. Uh, and three, the responsibility to vote on the termination of a call of any minister of this congregation shall remain with the confirmed voting members. So the way that the Lutheran Church works, like they, they kind of manage where pastors are placed. So you are, the synod like gives you candidates. So it's very much a process that the ELCA drives. And so that's why that piece is there as well. So, so even with the one, two, and three, who is a member? Anyone who says, uh, yeah, I'm in. So there's no question of whether they fulfill the ELC requirement for baptism or confirmation for the entire ways in which we function as a community here in this place, for how much you show up, plug in. Anyone who signs our charter, which we can sign today, uh, they, are, they are available, um, they are fully a member of this congregation who, yes, have been present and involved in the last year, um, who can, we can all participate in serving in leadership positions, we can vote on the budget and other issues that determine the mission of our church here in this corner of Kirkland. So the Constitution team worked hard to find a way for those who were not ready for baptism and confirmation to be fully involved in the life of Salt House. Again, we're talking about membership here, right? Not belonging. We're talking about membership. And so this is something that fits that, that also, that fits who we are as well as fitting what needs to happen with the ELCA. There are these, uh, there are these three, one, two, three limits uh, to the interfacing with the ELCA issues, which we hoped we wouldn't have to have at all, but they really are denominational pieces, and these small limits are so much looser than any ELCA constitution that I have ever seen. So this is actually incredibly progressive. So our constitution team has so much more to say about this, so please come to the forum if you have questions. If I haven't been clear, like, if you, if you want to stand up and shake your fists, like come shake your fists, you know, and they'll have more to share beyond just this issue too about the other pieces they've worked on within the Constitution. So this has been a very different kind of conversation for a sermon, I know, uh, but we are just in a certain season where it's good for us to do this together on Sundays. But to close, um, I want to offer two things, one thing of hope about the ELCA and then a bit from our scripture for today as well. 
So first, the first thing. So Kim Saunders and I had a phone call with the secretary of the ELCA, who's in Chicago, who, among other, th other things, is responsible for overseeing the official constitutions of our, of our denomination. His name is Chris Berger, and one of the fun, wonderful connections about Chris is that he used to be the bishop here in Northwest Washington, um, and he actually used to attend this church when it was Trinity Lutheran Church. And he was, when he was in high school, he attended Lake Washington High School, and, uh, and he attended Trinity which, and so he just has such joy, that life and ministry, that God is still here in this place. So it's pretty cool just to, anyway, just to talk with him, and he just sends such ah, excitement about it. So um, just like that. Maybe he didn't do that, but that was my response. Anyway, so he's not really that kind of guy. Anyway, the one, and one, anyway, one of the great words of hope that we heard from Chris, though, was how there is already a heated conversation happening in the ELCA at the top regarding membership around baptism. Already there's this movement for greater inclusion. Chris said that baptism is being used like a club in two senses, like it's like joining a club. Hey, welcome, just come on in, like that kind of thing, and people are feeling excluded. But more critically, and this is how we really meant it, was baptism is being used as a club, like as a weapon that hurts people, that keeps them from feeling included in the life of God, like it's becoming a divisive thing. So we're not just talking about membership, but it's keeping people from feeling like they belong. And that's not okay. So these conversations are happening now. And I'm so grateful to hear that that is the case. To be clear, I wish we didn't have to have any of those little numbers after our letter F but it is a good start for us, and we will continue to push the bounds of welcome within our institution in the years to come, and the ELC is already working on that too, so there's great hope in that. And finally, our text for today, the Great Commission. You still remember it? Should we read it again? You good? Okay. So Jesus commissions his followers, you know, then and throughout time, to do two things, to go, yes, and baptize, but also to go and teach. And uh, that's what mo many versions say, but I really like this version where Jesus says, train everyone you meet in this way of life. Instruct them in the practice, in this way of life, in this practice. And, and did you notice that some of them, it says they held back from worshiping, they didn't want to be all in, uh, that this was actually Jesus resurrected, that they, they weren't sure how they felt, where they stood. Other translations simply say some worshiped while others doubted. And I love that because notice, Jesus says this to all of them. He commissions all of them, regardless of if they were doubting or worshiping, wherever they found themselves in their journey. Like we have named throughout this morning, Jesus practices radical welcome and inclusion, even to send those who are doubting or unbaptized or not all in or wherever they find themselves. Sends everyone as those who can still live and love and teach about the way of life that Jesus shows us. That's radical welcome indeed, yes? And for which we give great, great thanks. So friends, let's pray. God, we breathe deeply and just connect once again to our bodies in this space and we thank you, God, for your love that knows no bounds. Not even in our attempts to limit you into our rituals. It doesn't work, for we know that you are in them. You are so present in baptism and in communion, but you are also beyond them. So as we take a few moments now to sing, we also open ourselves to listen, to hear how you have stirred us, bringing up memories of our own journey and history with you and baptism or no baptism. God, we let it all come into our awareness as we listen to your word spoken to us here in this silence. We listen for grace and the acceptance that you have for each of us and for all in this moment. So let us rest in your grace now as we sing, Come, Lord Jesus, come. <laughs>